This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker, uh, Andreas Edgers from uh, Munich, um, who is going to be talking about the Berlin crisis of 1961, a subject I know a little bit about, but, uh, but I'd be fascinated to learn more. So, over to you. Well, thank you for the nice introduction and the invitation to come here. Um, the great testing place of Western courage and will, John F. Kennedy, credibility in the Berlin crisis of 1961. On August 16, 1961, three days after access to West Berlin had begun to be closed by East Germany, West Germany's largest daily, ta daily tabloid build site entitled in its characteristically large letters, um, the East is acting, what is the West doing? The West is doing nothing. Kennedy, President Kennedy remains silent, Macmillan is hunting, and Adenauer is complaining about the hunt. The main message of the paper's editorial on the left part of the front page read, we are disappointed. Disappointed in the Western alliance, which claimed that Allied rights had not been touched, and which seemed to leave the Germans, and especially the West Berliners, alone in one of their darkest hours. Hardly moved by public pressure, Berlin's governing mayor, Willy Brandt, had already sent a letter to Kennedy uh, the day before with a similar message. In it, he criticized the weak reactions of the Western allies, and while he said he didn't doubt Allied guarantees for the freedom of West Berlin, he warned of, quote, political, psychological dangers in two respects. One was the growing confidence of the Eastern powers if the West didn't react stronger. The second was, quote, a crisis of confidence in Western powers. West Berlin, instead of being the place people flee to, could now become the place that people flee from, unquote. Kennedy was angry about the quiet, undiplomatic letter from Germany. In his response on August 18, 1961, he told Brandt that only military action might reverse what had happened a few days before, and that no one had demanded that. And Kennedy informed the governing mayor about the actions he was planning to take, among them sending Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson and General Lucius D. Clay, who had been in charge of the airlift and in high regard among the Berliners, um, to the city as his personal emissaries. Kennedy also planned to reinforce Western garrisons. While he called the letter, quote, symbolic, but not symbolic only, that also fit, I would argue, his decision to send Johnson and Clay. Kennedy's decision to act in a symbolic but not, only, but not symbolic only way had also come after having received messages echoing Brunts from Ambassador Walter C. Dowling and maybe more importantly from Edward C. Morrow, who had arrived in West Berlin by chance in a way. He was on the European tour on August 12th, one day before East Germany had closed access to both West Berlin. The director of the USIA described, quote, a crisis of confidence which endangers quite seriously our position. Morrow worried mostly about the psychological climate, and he recommended to, quote, take a number of steps which need not necessarily affect the substance of our position, but which, if sufficiently well publicized, would evidence the interest and support which we have so often pledged, end of quote. Mer Morrow and then also Kennedy understood that one of the key concepts in the Cold War was at stake here, America's credibility, and that something needed to be done to restore it. In the following, I will first define credibility and talk about its relevance during the Cold War. I will then discuss Berlin's significance, especially for American foreign policy after World War II, and focus in more detail on the Second Berlin Crisis, which led to a brief but serious crisis of American credibility. I will end with a Christmas message from President Kennedy. You will later see why. The Oxford English Dictionary defines credibility as, quote, the quality of the incredible, an instance or case of this. And it also mentions its use in context of defense policy based on the theory of the effectiveness of nuclear deterrent. Deterrent is actually a much wider used term, but it is normally, as in, in the definition I just quoted, very closely related to nuclear weapons. Credibility in the Cold War, especially once politicians and military people thought about what became flexible response, however, cannot just be tied to the atomic bomb. 
In its dictionary of military and associated terms, the US Department of Defense therefore rightly talks about, quote, the prevention of action by the existence of a credible threat of unacceptable counteraction and or belief that the cost of action outweighs the perceived benefits. Many definitions, including the last one, only focus on the opponent, though. But as not only the Berlin case shows credibility, and Robert McMahon discussed this at length too, regards, um, regarded among the most critical of all US foreign policy objectives, he said, uh, has a double meaning. It's uh, credibility to the enemies, um, but also America's credibility to its allies. And I think they're both equally important. The, uh, the allies should not doubt that the US would be ready to use military force to defend their freedom and territorial integrity. And both credibility towards the enemies and, and to, to the allies um, were both about beliefs and perceptions. Um, John Lewis Geddes rightly argued perceptions of power could be as important as the real thing. And this is the psychological effect that Morrow also had. The second Berlin crisis, the first one being the Berlin blockade of 1948-49, began in 1958 with Soviet demands for a new status of East Germany and West Berlin. Nikita Khrushchev wanted Berlin to become a free and demilitarized city. He also threatened to sign a separate peace treaty with the GDR. His goal was to drive the Western powers out of the city. Not everyone in the Kremlin was happy about this strategy, which some thought rather risky. But his ulti first ultimatum finally ran out. Um, nevertheless, Berlin remained a hot issue in the Cold War, and the incoming Kennedy administration expected a crisis during the first year. For both sides, Berlin had a highly symbolic significance. About 180 kilometers inside the GDR, it was here where the two opposite opposing blocks met directly in a divided city where access was still open in 1960. Both parts of the city were made into showcases to prove the superiority of the respective system. For the United States, which had made a commitment to Berlin during the airlift, the western part of the city resembled the mythical frontier of the 19th century. Berliners fought against an uncivilized and unfree world. The city was an outpost of freedom at the front line, surrounded by evil and darkness. In that sense, Berlin became an American city. And in Kennedy's famous words at Schoenberg City Hall in 1963, quote, all free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And that is how Ich bin ein Berliner has to be understood. If normally people think, you know, he said, I'm really a citizen of that, that place. He meant Berlin stands for freedom internationally, so everyone could be a Berliner who's for American by freedom. The symbolic significance of the city was equally high for the Soviet Union, which is often forgotten. When the economic situation deteriorated, thousands of East Germans, um, among them many academics, engineers, doctors, left the GDR via West, West Berlin. The SED leadership put increasing pressure on Khrushchev to act. At the summit meeting with Kennedy in early June 1961, the Soviet leader renewed the ultimatum. And here I have a nice contemporary cartoon on this. Um, both left Vienna basically threatening each other with war over Berlin. Kennedy, who in Khrushchev's eyes had shown weakness during the failed Bay of Pigs invasion, had tried to make clear that the United States and its Western allies would not give in regarding Berlin, but the perception not just in the Western press, was that his Russian counterpart had put him on the defensive. The stakes were high, and the outcome of the conflict, Dean Acheson argued after the Vienna summit, quote, will go far to determine the confidence of Europe, indeed of the world, in the United States. It is not too much to say that the whole position of the United States is in the balance. The consensus quickly was that Kennedy had to send a clear message to counter the perception of weakness. The president's speech on the Berlin crisis on July 25, 1961 was meant to restore American credibility with regard to the Soviet Union. Kennedy warned that an attack on West Berlin, quote, will be regarded as an attack upon us all. The security and freedom of West Berlin was inseparable from America's security and freedom. And in his so-called three essentials, he made clear where no compromise would be possible. The first was the occupation rights of the Western allies, um, the second, the free access to West Berlin, and the third, the freedom of the West Berliners. At length, Kennedy talked about Berlin's significance, and I'll, I'll show a short clip from that speech because it 
includes a, a number of the things that I've already mentioned, but in, in, in a very concise form. I hope the sound works. One hundred and ten miles from inside East Germany, surrounded by Soviet troops, and close to Soviet supply lines, has many roles. It is more than a showcase of liberty, a symbol, an island of freedom in a communist sea. It is even more than a link with the free world, a beacon of hope behind the Iron Curtain, an escape hatch for refugees. West Berlin is all that. But above all, it has now become, as never before, the great testing place of Western courage and will, a focal point where our solemn commitments, stretching back over the years since 1945, and Soviet ambitions, now meet in basic... Our flotation, sorry, last word was cut off. I mean, the imagery is you know, the beacon of hope, the island of freedom, and the the sea, but then also the great testing place of Western courage and will. The speech in which Kennedy also asked Congress for even more defense spending and requested money for civil defense led to strong reactions in Moscow. According to John McCloy, Khrushchev stated that the president had in effect declared preliminary war on the Soviets. The speech had an additional unintended effect. Um, since Kennedy repeatedly and deliberately had only spoken about West Berlin, um, that was registered in East Germany as well, so the stream of refugees even grew after that speech because they you know, weren't, weren't sure what, what might happen now, which put additional pressure on the SED and on Khrushchev, who finally agreed to the closing of the borders between the, the two parts of the city, which began on August 13, 1961. Kennedy, um, Robert Dalek put it nicely, responded to the border closing with studied caution. The U.S. government, or rather the State Department, sent a strong protest, but that was it for a couple of days. How to explain this reaction? I think there are two main reason, reasons. One is the three essentials that Kennedy had, had declared earlier in the speech that I just mentioned had not been violated by building the wall. Um, it was the East Germans who were kept in, and, and all the rest was still okay until then. And the freedom of the East Berliners had never been a reason to go to war for. Kenny O'Donnell, one of Kennedy's close advisors, described uh, Kennedy's view of the situation later. Quote, actually, he saw the wall as the turning point that would lead to the end of the Berlin crisis. He said to me, why would Khrushchev put up a wall if he really intended to seize Berlin? There wouldn't be any need of a wall if he occupied the whole city. This is his way out of the predicament. It is not a very nice solution, but a wall is a hell of a lot better than a war. But Kennedy had underestimated the psychological effect of the events in Berlin, which led to a second credibility crisis regarding Berlin that summer and fall, this time regarding America's allies, as I described at the beginning of my talk. According to Murrow, Kennedy's speech on July 25th had been viewed as a firm public confirmation of the United States' commitment to Berlin. In contrast to that, the American reaction to the border closing had led to what Morrow called disillusionment, a feeling of letdown in Germany. Kennedy had to react again, and he did so, sorry. Um, Kennedy had to react, and he did so mostly with symbolic politics, sending Vice President Johnson, um, um, Vice President Johnson and Lucius Clay, as well as 1,500 soldiers to West Berlin to restore confidence. Now, 1,500 soldiers don't in the case of war, wouldn't have made any difference. Again, it's symbolic politics. Ambassador Dowling on August 20th, after Johnson and Clay had welcomed the soldiers at the border, um, came to Washington that Johnson's and Clay's visit had brought, quote, a record-breaking one million people to the streets. And here's some photos. And you might see um, Johnson and Clay. In, in here is Johnson and Clay. Johnson got out of the car, I mean, something, of course, impossible these days. Johnson got out of the car several times. People handed him bottles of wine. He just loved being in the crowds and being cheered. And this is something you probably all, also won't see in many countries these days anymore. American um, soldiers here driving down Kurfürstendamm, here the, the, the Gedächtniskirche, and people out there like it's carnival celebration. So celebrating the 1500. The visit Dowling Road was, quote, an overwhelming success in restoring Berlin morale. 
the most significant event in Berlin history since lifting the blockade. Like Clay and Johnson, the 1,500 American soldiers had been, they had been sent from West Germany to West Berlin, proving that access was still possible, so another one of the essentials, were cheered by large crowds. And again, Dowling wrote, battle group commander said only comparable welcome was when we liberated France. I think he overdid it a little bit, but the reaction was, was, um, was quite extraordinary. To conclude, Kennedy's famous visit to West Berlin in June of 1963 was a belated and additional part of his mostly symbolic politics in dealing with the crisis of consequence after the border closure. He was successful in restoring American credibility among West Berliners and West Germans, and one could argue also regarding the East. After, the, after all, the Russians had not taken West Berlin by force, Instead, they had, to, had agreed to lock in the East Germans, but their symbolic politics building, and, and it's more than just symbolic, their politics, the building of the wall remained a visible symbol, not of the strength or superiority of their system, but of its inhumanity and cruelty. The famous tank confrontation at Checkpoint Charlie in mid-October 1961 showed what could have happened. Um, and in this case, the, one of the three essentials was touched. That's why the reaction, and it's so hard also for my students and others, you know, the wall is built, nothing happens. Um, East German border guards ask Americans to show IDs, and a few days later, you have a tank confrontation at Checkpoint Charlie that could have led to, to war. So it, it only makes sense with regard to Allied rights and the three essentials of Kennedy. And it was also part of it was Clay's overreaction. He really wanted to show strength um, on the Americans. So for 16 hours on, August, on October 27th to 28th, um, American and Russian tanks faced each other there. And um, this is an early, before flexible response became the official policy. This is, this is a, a, one of the a number of documents of those days. It's October 61, about the sequence of military actions in the Berlin conflict. And here, so it starts with the, the, the East Germans um, trying to take some of the American rights and then, you know, what will we do, what might happen then, and it ends general nuclear war. So I don't know if Kennedy would have gone that far. On the other hand, Berlin, he, the stakes were so high in Berlin that they at least thought this could, conflict over Berlin could end in something like this. Mission accomplished, credibility restored, but the Germans, to Kennedy's irritation, wanted to hear America's promise again and again. And he delivered repeatedly in other presidents did too, also in a very special form that might also have had to do with his recognition that he at first had not reacted strongly enough in August 1961. And here comes the Christmas message from President Kennedy that I had promised earlier, which was shown on Berlin TV um, on December 25th. I think he only, he never did this before. And now, our Christmas message from President John Kennedy. On this anniversary of the birth of the Prince of Peace, my fellow Americans and I extend our warmest greetings to you, the people of Berlin. We observe this season of peace and spiritual rededication at a time of crisis. Peace on earth, goodwill to men, real peace, real goodwill, is more of a goal than a reality. Until truly there is goodwill among men, not walls dividing them, our pursuit of peace shall continue. During these days, which ought to bring families together, many of you are thinking of loved ones who are forcibly separated from you. Our deepest sympathy goes out to all those who suffer from this imposed separation especially at this time of year. For all of us, for freedom itself, this is a time of trial. I need not remind you in Berlin of America's determination to support and sustain you in freedom. The bonds which tie us have been tested before. We are at your side now, as before. We shall stay. The Christmas lights of free Berlin cast a glow which penetrates deep into the darkness surrounding. No wall can keep out this light. We know that this beacon will continue to shine brightly for many years to come. With confidence and conviction, therefore, let us rededicate ourselves to the principles of peace and goodwill towards men, which guided the life of him 
whose birth we celebrate at Christmas. This rededication will be a source of inspiration to men everywhere. Good evening and a happy Christmas to you all. Thank you. Uh, excellent.